cloud. Okay, good. All right, well, let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So we're starting uh, the second letter of Timothy, but it's really very similar material, and it's uh, meant to remind us of um, not just what it means to be a bishop, but uh, what it also means to be a parent, a pastor, a catechist, a teacher, an elder. So keep all of us um, mindful of these things which, uh, of, of these things which St. Paul and behind him, of course, the Holy Spirit writes to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, by the way, as we uh, take open our Bibles, um, there are different ways of seeing what the Bible, some people like to call it their sword. Um, but you know, it's also a love letter from God. Um, St. Augustine has a saying. He says, uh, verbum dei non es palicumque verbum, said verbum spirens amorem, which means that the word of God is not any old word, but rather it is a word breathing forth love. Okay? And so what we want to remember as we read these things is that they're a great letter of love and, and, and care from God. Some people say, well, I'm having trouble hearing his voice or I'm, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like my prayer life is, you know, kind of dried up or whatever. So I would say that uh, at times like that, take up God's word and, but before you open it and just say, okay, let's see what we got here. Um, remember, this is like a love letter from your father who loves you. So I, I gave this example. I've given this in homilies before. But, you know, when I was a kid in 1968, my dad went to Vietnam. And, um, you know, it was a scary year. I and mean, everybody, who, anyone who lived through 1968 knows what a terrible and tragic year that was for so many reasons. I mean, we had Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. Robert Kennedy was assassinated. We had the Hong Kong flu or 100,000 people lost their lives in the Hong Kong flu, just in this country, a million worldwide. Uh, we had, um, you know, people were smoking dope, you know, and there were anti-war protests and just the whole, the whole world seemed to be melting down all around us. And on top of that, we were in the Vietnam War and my dad was away. And, um, but every, every week there would come a letter from dad, uh, sometimes a cassette tape even. That was really high tech in those days, y'all a cassette tape. And, uh, he, you know, it would come in the mail and here's a letter from dad. And we were all excited. We would listen to mom would read the letter to us, uh, screening out, I'm sure, certain things we didn't need to see or hear. <laughs> uh, and uh, so we would, uh, we, you know, again, all of these are ways of saying it was a letter from dad and it was so exciting. And so what I would encourage you to do sometimes in moments where you feel like you can't hear God's voice, well, this is God's voice. You hear it with your eyes but you're hearing his words. He's speaking to you. He's talking to you. And so that's, that's the beauty of studying this word, isn't it? So we're opening up now this letter from, from our Heavenly Father, see? Uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit and written through St. Paul. But again, it's, it's to us too. It's, uh, all right, so with that in mind, um, let me just get us started on a couple of verses and then I'll get maybe one of you to help me, okay? Um, so let's get, we're in 2 Timothy in verse 1. And he simply, as I told you before, when you, write a, when you would write a letter in the ancient world, there would be a superscript. Um, and it, it, this is it right here. Um, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace and mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, when we write letters, I've told you this before, we say, dear so-and-so. Whereas Paul says, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then uh, we say, dear so-and-so. So we give the recipient's name, and we leave our name to the bottom of the letter. But in these ancient letters, your name, the writer, would always be in the superscript. In other words, the top of the letter, okay? And so that's a very, this is a very standard classical uh, definition. Now, it's theological in the sense that, um, you know, an, a pagan might write something like, uh, you know, uh, um, Tichicus, uh, to, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, Tichicus, the local city, uh, plumber, uh, to, uh, um, to, to so-and-so, uh, grace and peace to you. They didn't mean it in the religious sense, but it was just, again, sort of, um, uh, uh, just a formality, you know, you would say. So, for example, you might start a letter to someone that you start out, you say, dear. <laughs> They, they may not be very dear to you, 
<laughs> and you may, the, the purpose of the letter may not be very friendly, <laughs> but it's a formality, right? So there are some formalities here. But notice what Paul describes himself as an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, okay? And according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. So he roots again his ministry in the call of God. We saw that in the first letter. Uh, that one is called to the ministry. One is not simply appoint themselves. And therefore, again, as we, we know in our own church, um, you don't just simply show up one day and say, I want to be a priest, let me in. Um, they, there's some discernment that's made. You know, there, there's, some inner, there's some looking at your background. There is um, a, a, you know, a manner of, um, uh, you, know, you have psychological exams, all that stuff. And then there's four or five years where you're studying and you're being observed, not just in terms of your learning, but also in terms of you know, the conduct of your life and so on. And even with all that, as you know, some still slip through uh, who shouldn't be priests. But with all that in mind, you don't just appoint yourself. You don't just say, hey, man, I, I, went to, I just got online and I, I got the certificate sent to me from the ministry school online. And that's just not the way it's supposed to work, okay? There is supposed to be a call from God that is discerned not just by you, but also by the church, okay? So, uh, Christ Je uh, uh, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. Now, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, um, <clears throat> according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, um, is, is, is a turn of a phrase that he only uses here. He doesn't use this kind of a phrase, but what he's, what he's saying here is um, that God, I, I think the best way to understand it is he's saying, Look, I was dead in my sins. Paul would write to the Romans, you were dead in your sins. But the Lord, who is rich in mercy, you know, gave you new life, uh, according to Christ Jesus. And he translated you out of the kingdom of darkness and brought you into the kingdom of light. So this promise, if you will, um, of life, God had promised this. So if you were to go back, say, to the Old Testament, you might find a text like uh, Jeremiah chapter 36. Oh, my people. I will open your graves, and I will have you come forth from them. Uh, I will take from you your heart of stone, and I will give you um, a true heart with which to love. Um, I will put my law within you and cause you to walk in my ways, and you will be my people, and I will be your God, says the Lord. So you see that there are many promises like this in the Old Testament. Ezekiel saw the image of all those dry bones come and start rattling and flesh start to come on them and they start to eventually get up. And so all those, 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 all those dead who rose uh, in the Lord. So this uh, promise was already in the Old Testament that we who were dead in our sins would be given life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So you see the beautiful vision here uh, that, that Paul's tapping into. Um, what do you, you know, a lot of times we think about God's justice as, you know, you did it, you get it. You know, we think about, uh oh, I'm in trouble now. Just here comes justice. But really, if you really study the word uh, justice, dikiosune in the Greek, you start to see that God's justice is his fidelity to his promises. Okay. So um, uh, God has, I have said it, says the Lord, and I will do it. That's God's justice. You see, he makes a promise. And to, uh, uh, you know, the call response you'd have in a typical African-American parish, he says, how many of y'all know that God is a promise keeper? And you're supposed to answer, amen, you know. And uh, so uh, it, it's a truism, right? God is a promise keeper. He is, uh, he is um, a one who can uh, draw us up and out of our, uh, you know, out, out of our, our situation and give us new life, see, if we will let him. Okay. So, and again, the, the, this idea of grace mercy and peace uh, from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, we've, we've looked at these words before, but just a quick review for you. Uh, grace, uh, the Greek word is charis, and um, uh, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's difficult to simply translate with one word. Um, uh, charis, though, means, again, first and foremost, something that is a gift. It isn't something that we acquire for ourselves. Um, we, um, it's, it's a gift, but it's a stable disposition of being in, in God's favor. Okay. So, uh, there's what we call sanctifying grace, which is the grace that makes us holy and uh, pleasing to God. Um, but there's also what we might call, um, um, 
the um, um, gracia gratis data um, is, is, is the charism. That's what I'm trying to think of, the charism. So there are also graces that are given uh, unto the giving of grace. Uh, a grace freely given is what gracia gratis data means in, in Latin, is a grace freely given. So um, what's, uh, what we mean here is that um, um, some people receive the gift to teach, some receive the gift to preach, some receive the gift of organizing and finance or administration, um, some receive the gift of music, and so on, all right? Now, the difference between the, the, the charisms as a stable, in other words, you don't, you're not a good organist like, or a choir director, say, or a musician one day, and then the next day you lose it. So it's a stable gift that's given to a person. But it's not so much for their good as it is for the good of others and for the good of the church. Uh, even unbelievers can be given charisms by God. You know, um, I've given this example before, but I've, I've met more than a few musicians up in choir loss that were atheists. But it's a paycheck, and they're, they're up there singing, making beautiful music, or an organist you know, uh, who was an unbeliever or living a, shall we say, not a, a very Christian life. Now, again, you say it shouldn't be that way, Father. I know, but the point is that the charism, the gift they have isn't given for their own sake. It's given for our sake. And hopefully that gift will draw them into a deeper relationship with God, but it doesn't always happen, you know? So I can only say um, uh, that when you see charisms in people, you need to sometimes remember it doesn't necessarily speak to their holiness or to their... Um, uh, that they're smart about everything. I remember somebody came to me one time and said, you're a good preacher. I said, well, thanks, I'll, I'll try. But they, they said, well, I have a question for you. And then they asked me a very difficult financial question. And I said, well, how would I know? I don't, I'm not a financial expert. I said, well, I, you know, you're, you're up there in that pulpit. You, you sound so smart. I said, well, that's, that's just a charism. It's, a, it's That's not me, that's God. <laughs> You know I mean? So it doesn't mean that I'm, if you're smart in one area, you're smart in every area. I would not want to ask, uh, uh, what's this Dr. Fauci? I wouldn't, want to, I wouldn't want to ask him to repair my car. All right? I mean, you know, so, okay, you get the idea. Now, so we have, we have uh, grace, of, and, and then uh, we have then this word mercy, mercy, which is, um, uh, again, a very um, um, rich word in the Greek, you know, in, in the Greek language here. Let me just, I'm looking up my Greek text here for a minute. Um, uh, so, charis uh, elos, ah, interesting, Irene, they put peace first. Um, but uh, elios, where we get like kyrie eleison, kyrie eleison. So what is, you know, this, this idea of mercy, um, it, it's more than just not lowering the boom. It's, it's literally, Eleos refers in the, in the Greek to a, a covenant loyalty, a covenant love. Because I'm in a relationship with God, see, um, that he has a loyalty to me and I to him. And so there is this idea of eleison means, you know, not just have mercy, Lord, because I'm a sinner, but Lord, keep me in this covenant relationship with you. Uh, by showing me your grace and your mercy. So help me, therefore, to become loyal to you. So it's not just a plea for mercy. It's also a plea for strength to avoid sin. And so when you go to confession, for example, there's two graces that come in the sacrament. There's the grace of absolution from your sins, okay, number one. But number two, there is grace to avoid sin in the future. And therefore, this idea of um, eleison, of mercy, is not simply, okay, I'll overlook your sin or I'll forgive you your sin, but I'm also going to strengthen you to be more loyal to me in my covenant, says the Lord. So mercy isn't just a rearguard action. It's actually a proactive thing. Do you, do you follow me? Hmm? This is very important because we're not just simply, you know, the passive recipients of mercy, but God gives us mercy in order to also to help us to do better, to avoid sin and to do better and to grow in grace. All right? So maybe you never thought about that when we're singing Lord have mercy at church or Kyrie eleison, right? Okay, but it's not just have mercy because I'm bad or done a bad thing, but, but also strengthen me to stay loyal to you and faithful to you in the covenant, all right? Now, um, uh, grace, uh, mercy, and peace. And we talked about Irene uh, is the Greek word. Now, Irene, we get the word, anyone who has, knows somebody named Irene, her name means peace. Uh, Irene, Irene, or Irene. 
means, it doesn't just mean we're not killing each other, we're not yelling at each other. It means that there is present in the relationship everything that should be there. So it's not just we're not yelling or yelling or killing each other, but we're also showing each other respect and love and we listen and we learn from each other. There's reciprocity, there's give and take. You see what I'm saying? It's a rich, full concept of the presence in the relationship of everything that should be there. And uh, so it's, it's a very positive concept, not simply the absence of negative things, okay? Now we've gone through this. I wanted to just quickly remind you though of these words because you know I think so often we use them uh, but we don't really pay much attention to their, to their deeper, richer meaning. A very related concept to this Irene is, uh, liter it means, you know, in, in the Greek, it literally means to have all the pieces. You know, you think of a jigsaw puzzle, or you think of a wall that's missing bricks. Ah, uh, that's not, there's no piece there. So you need, a, but a, a, a wall that has pieces is, is, uh, has all the bricks in place. A puzzle that's completed has all the puzzle pieces put together. Yeah, so it's related to our, in, our insight in English uh, with the word integrity, right? Which means to have all the things that are necessary, uh, all, the, all the pieces of the puzzle, okay? Good, so, all right. Now, why don't I get someone to help me? Um, we could read maybe verses three through seven. So who would like to uh, maybe do a little reading for us? Okay, uh, Liz, uh, let me unmute you here. Uh, okay, unmute. Okay, I'm not able to unmute you. You'll have to unmute yourself. Again, we're starting with verse three through seven. And what translation are you using? Uh, Divike. Uh, okay, that's probably the RSV. Okay, good. Okay. I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience as did my fathers, when I remember you constantly in my prayers. As I remember your tears, I long, I long night and day to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother, Louise, and your Lois. mother, yeah. Eunice. And now I am sure dwells in you. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within, that is within you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give you a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and love and self-control. All right, good, good. Now, I want to say that um, um, <clears throat> eh, there's a kind of a Jewishness to this. Uh, hey, I thank God. I think of you constantly in my prayers, day and night. I never stop thinking of you. You're always in my prayers. Oh, I never forget about you. Uh, you know, there's kind of a, there's a certain Jewish hyperbole here. I mean, not that he doesn't remember him, but, you know, there, you can kind of see the piling on. It's a very Jewishness to this. Uh, to this phrasing here, I remember you as I as I remember your tears, and I long to see the day that you know the day that I can see you, and I'll be filled with joy. Oy vey, oy vey, oy vey. Okay, so um, I, I love these things because it, it, it's a beautiful part of the reason. A lot of scholars think that uh, that uh, there's a lot of this hyperbole in Jewish speaking at least to our mind, because they didn't have as many comparative words as we do, like more, less, greater. So for example, when Jesus says, you must love me and hate your mother and father, and he doesn't literally mean despise them, but he means love me more, love me the most. So in, you know, in, in, in Hebrew, you would say, I like chocolate and I hate vanilla. Uh, actually, no, I like, I just prefer the chocolate. So in other words, you see the idea? But they, they speak in rather absolute terminology. Uh, and so there's a lot of uh, uh, hyper, hyperbolic kind of expression that sort of just comes from the language itself. Uh, so that I don't know that ancient Jews sounded like a Jew from New Jersey or New York. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm using the sound of the Jackie Mason accent there, you know, but uh, you get the idea. But there is a very Jewish quality to this. Um, and then also to, oh, I remember you. I remember your grandmother, Lois. Oh, what a woman, you know, 
I'm kind of reading into this, right? And, and, uh, and your mother Eunice, I'm going to just tell you right now, they were great women. And that because you're, you know, you're, you're, you're a great man because of them. Remember, don't ever forget that. See, you know, and so there's a, this is the kind of, um, uh, I don't want you to miss the, <laughs> the rather personal kind of colloquial quality to some of this. It's beautifully done. And, and, uh, uh, you know, if we sit there in church and just read it formally, you know, with a sort of sour face look, you know, we kind of missing the point that this is a very tender, but also a very Jewish <laughs> way of speaking. Okay. Now, there, but there comes then this key phrase. Um, um, I remind you, um, therefore, uh, says here, to fan into flame the gifts of God, uh, which is in you through the laying out of my hand. So, uh, just, this is a beautiful image, you know, if you've ever tended a fire, I mean, you know, back when I was a teenager, it was my job to, in the cold nights, to light the, to put a fire in the fireplace and to keep it going. We had logs and that started with the kindling, but, you know, at a certain point, the things would just kind of go to glowing embers. And so you'd have to sort of use the bellows and, and sort of, you know, uh, blow some air into the fire to make it leap up again and put another log on the fire. And so this idea that a fire can be ra you know, roaring and giving lots of beautiful heat, but eventually the fire can begin to die down. It just kind of goes to glowing embers on, on its way to just going out. And so this is an image for the spiritual life, right? That you need to fan into flame the gifts that God has given you. You need to make use of them. You need to remember um, just daily to go to God and say, bless me. And you need to stay in your game. I need to keep reading every day, writing as much as I can. I, I, I need to certainly keep praying every day. There's a beautiful line in the book of Leviticus in chapter 6, and I think it's verse 6. It says regarding the priest, he must keep the fire burning on the altar. It must not go out. It must not go out. Now, uh, that, that fire in the ancient temple was kept burning night and day, 24-7, you know, 365. And those priests had one job. I mean, not just one job, but they're, 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 they were... They're, they're made, they had to keep that fire going. That fire was not to go out. And that's an image for prayer and for worship. See? So uh, it fan into flame the gifts of God's love. So all of you have had a God lit, lit a fire in you on the day that you were baptized. He put his Holy Spirit in you. He lit a fire in you. And again, what does it mean to fan into flame these gifts except that, you know, you're, you're, you're doing your part to make sure you show up for prayer. You're doing your part to make sure that you engage in spiritual reading, uh, that you are doing your part to uh, say, yes, God, if you can use anything, use me. And so we don't literally fan it into flame, but we, we say, God, I'm willing for you to keep this fire burning and growing in my heart, all right? So it's a very beautiful and a powerful image. And notice again, we see here the image of ordination, the laying on of hands. Now, Paul, in the other letter, mentioned the presbyters laying hands uh, on, on um, uh, you know, on, on Timothy. In this letter, he mentions that I laid hands on you. So maybe the first ordination was his ordination to the priesthood, and he's talking here about his ordination to, the, to being a bishop. I don't know for sure, but I'm just saying that he has a sort of a different way he describes it here. Not when, I, when the elders laid hands on you. The elders means the presbyteroi, the priest. Um, now, in an ordination rite, uh, the bishop, of course, is the he's the ordaining prelate, but the priest, because they share this one priesthood, also come and lay hands on the men to be ordained. Although they're not the ordaining prelate, they're showing a connection between their priesthood and this, these new priests, that there's really only one priesthood. It's, it belongs to Jesus, and we're simply, you know, his ministers, or you know, he configures us to himself so that we ex he exercises his one priesthood through all of us. So there's one priesthood uh, that we all share in, okay? So that's the image of being ordained a priest. Now, when a bishop is ordained, priests do not come and lay hands on a bishop who's being ordained. Rather, um, a couple of other ordaining prelates do that. Um, and uh, uh, so we, we see that it's, it's, there seems to be a, a slightly different way he described it here, perhaps because even at this early stage, one was ordained a priest, and then when he was made a bishop, he was ordained again. He wasn't just named, okay, we're going to name you a bishop, okay? Can't say for sure, but that would be, that would be the, uh, the implication. Now, it goes on to stay here. Um, and again, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you, but through the laying on of my hands. 
For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of, of power and love and self-control. Okay. Now, again, it doesn't hurt to just look at um, maybe a little bit of the, the meanings of, of, of these three words. But first of all, just notice the first one, that um, God did not give us a spirit of fear. All right. So if you do have fear, it didn't come from God. All right. Now, I, look, let's, be, let's make a distinction. There are, there are some good fears that we should have. If you're walking near the edge of a cliff, I want you to be afraid. That's fear of, you know, but we're talking here about this kind of this, this fear of not being liked, this fear of being intimidated or uh, laughed at or scorned or, you know, you know, whatever it might be. So this is the kind of fear that, that uh, this is the context here, you know. Um, so, um, so again, God did not give us a spirit of timidity or fear. Sometimes it's translated fear, right? Um, so um, let's see here. Let me get to the, just double check a few Greek words here. Um, yeah, all right. So, um, uh, those pneuma, a spirit of, yeah, cowardice, yeah. Delais, delea, delea. Yeah, cowardice, timid, okay. Not much more to say there. Uh, maybe uh, it's interesting, though. In the Greek, in the Greek, um, there, there, there's a there's a there's another shadow of meaning, reticence. Uh, so it's not just fear. I'm afraid to say something or do something, but there's a, there's a reticence that can sometimes set up. And there's a subtlety that we have in English about that word, huh? So to be reticent means to be sort of hesitating or kind of kind of frozen in caution. Uh, so you see there's, there's subtleties uh, to the word. It isn't just like, well, I'm afraid to talk about that or to, to do this. Um, it, there could also just be a reticence that's more subtle and therefore can be more powerful. Um, we're reticent to do certain things, you know? We're reticent to get out of our comfort zone. We're reticent to do new things. We're, we're reticent, to, we're, we're hesitating. We draw back uh, to engage in, um, uh, fraternal correction, you see, and things like this. And it's, it's more dangerous because it's more subtle, see, more subtle. And uh, sometimes we just love to say, well, I'm just being prudent. But prudence doesn't mean never doing anything. Prudence means what's the best way forward given the circumstances, see. So we don't want to confuse prudence and reticence. All right, so um, we, we, see, we see this word. Now we also have um, uh, a couple of other things that are said here. God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but of, uh, of, uh, of love. And the Greek word there is agape. So we're talking about that high form of love. Also of power. Now this is where we get that the Greek word here is dynamos. And it means like that's where we get the word dynamite. So in other words, it's not just power in the sense of strength, uh, big muscles or, or, or a money, that kind of power. But, but a dynamos means that there's a dynamic quality, uh, a power, a, um, a, um, a zeal, uh, an energy within us, and a, kind of an explosive energy. Remember how Jeremiah said, I, I, the word of God just came to me like fire all shut up in my bones. I got to preach it because otherwise it's just like fire shut up in my bones. See, this is that dynamos. This, this is that, that eagerness, that power that you cannot not speak. Uh, and so it's a very dynamic, if I could put it that way, dunamos is a dynamic word. Uh, and we get the word dynamite from it. Okay. Um, and then we come finally to this idea of self-control. And the, the, the Greek word there is sophronius. And according to my Greek text here, it's sophronius. And again, sophronius is, a, is also a very interesting word. You can almost hear the word um, uh, sophia in it, right? Um, it, it makes one apt for wisdom because they're able to discipline themselves uh, to exercise a, a self-control. Um, one is able to, you know, to moderate. And this makes us apt for wisdom and for learning. So sophronius is a Greek word uh, for self-control. But you see, again, it isn't just self-control for its own sake, but self-control leads us then to, for example, to discipline ourselves to study or to dis discipline ourselves to come to a Bible study or to discipline ourselves to engage in a certain work or to moderate our 
appetites and things like that, that that could affect our mind's capacity. So um, uh, there's a kind of a temperateness that we uh, we want to find um, that makes our mind apt. So the word uh, sophronia is also somewhat related to the word for sobriety, right? To be sober doesn't just mean I'm not drunk. It means that I have a clear mind that can see. See, but if I'm weighed down with sins and intemperateness, too much food, too much drink, too much of the world, too much TV, too much you know passive things, my mind is kind of goes on holiday, and I, I just kind of lose my way. So you see how all these things kind of tie together. The self-control isn't just about moderating your appetites, but it's also about keeping a good, clear mind. But otherwise, I tell you, the higher faculties go on holiday uh, if we're not watching some of those lower uh, desires, okay? Well, okay. Maybe this is a little bit too much, but sometimes it's good to just see that these words, when he lists these kinds of virtues, to look at the original text in the Greek, to see that there's a lot of subtleties and meaning that don't always come through uh, in English, okay? All right. Um, so before we go on, I'm going to start with uh, verse 8 here in a minute, but um, any comments, questions, rebuttals? So Liz, why don't you prepare then to read verses 8 through, oh, I don't know, um, um, 8 through 12. And we'll need to unmute you first. So are you unmuted? Hmm. Can okay. you hear me? Good. Okay. Eight through 12. Be, okay. Do not be ashamed then of testifying to our Lord, nor to me, his prisoner, but take your share of suffering for the gospel in the power of God, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not in virtue of our works, but in virtue of his purpose, of his own purpose, and the grace which he gave us in Christ Jesus ages ago, and now has manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. For this gospel, I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, and therefore I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know who I have believed, and I am sure that he is able to guard until the day, that day what has been entrusted to me. <clears throat> well, si well, Sister Liz, I'm hearing something of a southern accent in your, in your reading there. Um, <laughs> it, it's coming through a little more than I've heard recently, and I just want you to know that it's, uh, it's very lovely. It's very lovely. <laughs> <laughs> when I commence the preaching. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hear that. I hear that southern, that lovely southern accent. I remember when I went down, I, I grew, I was in Chicago and um, I, um, at, at age like nine or 10, we moved down to Jacksonville, Florida, which might as well be north of southern Georgia. Mm. Because it's a very <laughs> southern town in those days. And uh, oh, all those accents, you know, and the waitresses and say, how you doing, sugar? What you want? <laughs> I had never been from Chicago. No one ever called me sugar. <laughs> oh, I when I when I travel uh, uh, west, um, and and I'm in a restaurant, and I start using some of the uh, vernaculars from the east, and you can tell when someone has traveled and they finally hear something they haven't heard in a long time. <laughs> oh God, hear yeah, somebody from home. But anyway. What's that old jazz song? When I take my sugar to tea. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. But anyway. Okay, well, good. Okay, we're well, back okay. to the text, but I digress. Yes. Uh, Connie's joining us just now, by the way, y'all. Connie's coming. Hi, Connie. Okay, now, um, so let's take a look. Don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. Now, the pro don't, don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. Now, unfortunately... <laughs> Well, let's put it this way. Paul puts it a little bit differently in Romans. He says, therefore, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe, Jew first and then the Gentile. Now, um, this, um, 
uh, this idea, um, you know, uh, not being ashamed is unfortunately, a lot of people are ashamed. Uh, we're hiding out. Uh, some of our, our, our teachings are not uh, in accord with uh, popular opinion today. Um, the, um, um, it's a very, um, um, well, let's put it this way. You've heard the expression before. What is right is not always popular, and what is popular is not always right. And, but again, we struggle a great deal today uh, when the, the world often tries to shame us in the silence, uh, calling us names like, or, or, or things intolerant, bigoted, homophobic, or uh, intolerant, or, uh, you know, even, you know, there's just all kinds of, you know, things that are hurled at us. Um, when we, we simply, for sincerely held religious beliefs, hold on to what God taught us about matters of sexuality or marriage uh, or things even like greed. Um, sometimes people like, you know, have other terms for us, like you're just a killjoy or you're just uptight, you know, all these kinds of things. And the fact that all we're suggesting is that God has set some limits for our consumption and our greed, uh, that, uh, that we're not just to just simply indulge everything. Um, so you get the idea. We're often going to be excoriated and hated. And because of this, none of us like tension. So a lot of times we stay quiet. Getting back to that word before, reticent. We're reticent to speak. Well, people will laugh at me or I might, uh, uh, I might not be able to tell all the answers. You know, I might, you know, so we get very, very quiet. Now, that's where we are today. We've been very quiet about many things that we should have been speaking about. And, uh, if you want to know why the world's a dark place, just don't look any further than, you know, Zoom rooms like this, where too, too many of us, I don't mean you personally, you know, we're not all equally to blame for this, but too many of us who call ourselves Catholics and Christians have not let our light shine. We put it under a bushel basket. We hid it under a bed. See, and that's why the world's in darkness, because there's only one light, and that's Jesus. And if he's not shining through us like a reflected light, the world's in darkness. And so... You know, evil triumphs when the good remains silent. Okay, so it's it's not and it's not just the usual sexual thing. It's about racism too. It's about greed. It's about you know so many issues that that afflict us in our time and our culture. And um, um, this is what happens. So you see, we're not to be ashamed, not to be ashamed uh, of the gospel, but we too often are. We too often are. Now Paul says here. Look at me, man, I'm in jail. You know, basically later on he says here, right? He says, uh, don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. See, uh, Paul got thrown into jail. Most of us have not been thrown into jail yet for preaching the gospel, okay? You know, come on, y'all. Let's be honest. You know, the ancient martyrs, you know, they faced lions. They, they were set on fire. They were beheaded. They, all kinds of stuff. Some of them were flailed alive. I mean, you know, come on. And we're afraid that somebody just raises their eyebrow at us. You know, see if we're not careful how timid we become. And so again, uh, I, I ask for your prayers for me is that I have the courage to continue to speak out um, on important moral issues, uh, popular or not. But I also ask uh, for you to pray for courage for yourself because I've got a pulpit in the church, but I'm talking to the already converted in a way. You're there because you, you're pretty much on board, or at least largely on board with these teachings and yes i can challenge you but at the end of the day you you've got to be the one to go to your family members and others who drifted away and say no look let's say it the lord uh and uh, and have that prophetic authority that give that the word of god gives you uh without anger without bitterness but just look dear i i can't i can't tell you that your future is going to look too rosy if you don't return to church you know you might just well go to hell you better be careful watch out you got to straighten up and fly right you know, and uh, we don't talk like that anymore, see? Uh, we just don't. And there's this kind of universalism. A lot of people think that just about everyone's going to go to heaven, but that's not what the Bible teaches. Um, God is not going to force anybody to love what he loves or who he loves. And so I leave you just with this image in terms of the urgency of the prodigal son story. The second son refusing to go into the feast. His father's pleading, come in. We have to celebrate. He says, I won't go in there on these terms. And that's why there's a hell. See? Because not everybody wants to love their enemy. Not everybody wants to live in peace with other people. Not everybody wants to be chased, you see? And God's not gonna force it. Okay, so we have to develop a kind of an urgency and stop being so ashamed. We have to kind of be sober. And we don't have to say, 
you know, every now and again, just let it slip. Oh, well, dear, I, you're not going to matter. Oh, mom, come on. It doesn't matter that much. It's, oh, well, I, I really worry about you. I just don't want you to go to hell. You know, and kind of you know, let it sink in a, a little bit and just kind of walk away, you know, and let, let it sink in. And sometimes we've got to rediscover the way Jesus spoke. He warned of hellfire. And so did St. Paul, I, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. You know, he spoke like that. See, most of us don't because we're afraid and ashamed if we're not careful. Now, I don't mean all of you equally. See, when I say we, I'm talking about that collective we, right? Some of you are bigger loud mouths than I am. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, okay. Moving on. Um, it says, uh, but share in the suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Key point. This is the normal Christian life. We like to think, oh, if I just love Jesus, everything will go well, and I'll, I'll have a prosperity gospel life, and everything is just... If you preach and try to live the gospel, you're going to suffer. You're going to have suffering. Now, I'm not trying to say your life's going to be miserable all the time, but I'm just going to say to you, prepare to suffer. Jesus promised it. He says, if, the, you, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, and I called you out of the world, therefore the world will hate you. All right? You're not greater than me. Look what they've done to me. Do you think, you know, you can, you can find a better way to preach the gospel than I did? And look what they did to me. And they're going to do that to you. Not necessarily absolute crucifixion, but you get the idea. We, we've got to accept the fact that the gospel isn't just for our consolation. The gospel, then, it, trying to live it and preach it, inflicts some, some degree of suffering on us. Um, again, we're, we're, we're going to suffer. So share in the suffering for the gospel um, by the power of God. See, God's not just asking you to suffer on your own. He's giving you grace to be strong. But you're going to suffer. Just count on it. Now, I gave you a, I've given you stories like this before. I, don't, I, I talked to you about this, um, this uh, pharmacist out there in Washington State, but let me give you another story. Um, there was a, a woman uh, uh, that I knew many years ago now, probably 20 years ago, who became the head nurse at a very large hospital in the D.C. area. Um, very prestigious position, and she was the head nurse. And so uh, at some point, that hospital decided that, look, we're going to start providing abortions in this hospital. And we want you to scrub in with the doctors when they do this. And we want you to teach the other nurses. And she says, I can't do that. Uh, my, my conscience can't, I won't, I, won't, I won't be able to assist with abortion. So they fired her. Now you, she, she lost a very highly prestigious position because she says, I cannot for sincerely held religious beliefs and my belief that this is the murder of a human being, I cannot and I will not assist in abortion. Get, I, I, I just won't. And uh, they fired her. Now, God was good to her. He got another good job. You know, uh, maybe not as prestigious, but you know what happens when you get the corner office, you lose sleep. You know, you get the biggie wow positions. Come on. If you pine after that stuff, you can have all my turns, man. Corner office means you're not going to sleep very well. You know, you get a lot of perks. Uh, maybe bonuses, but you're going to toss and turn in the night. You're going to worry, and it's kind of cutthroat, and you're going to make a lot of compromises and stuff. Don't, don't, don't pine for that stuff, okay? And if, if God ever does trap you into being in some biggie wow position, uh, just be humble. And, and, and try and, and don't don't try to cling to the power and the prestige of it too much because it it is not that it is not that good. I mean, again, in my in my field, for example, anybody who wants to be a bishop should have his head, have his head taken and examined. You know, just he's, he's just crazy to want to be a bishop. You know, I mean, just crazy. They have all these worries, and I, I, look, I have people who know me and love me. You can call me father, and I, I love you. And we, many of us have been together for years, and some of you are new friends here. But I, I, I live the life of Riley. I'm loved, I'm supported. But bishops live a very lonely life. They don't have a parish. They don't have parishioners. They, and they're kind of, they go to parishes and who are kind of relieved when they're out the door. And uh, it's a lonely life, but it had, they have all the headaches. They have all the pressures. So now what the point I'm t trying to make here, telling the story about this, sister, this uh, woman that I knew, the head nurse at a very large hospital was, she suffered for the gospel. And if we think we're just going to get through this life and everything just be fine, uh, and we're really trying to live the Christian life, think again. You're probably going to you're going to probably meet some resistance. You're going to you're going to meet some some trouble along the way. And 
as the apostles did in the Acts of the Apostles, rejoice that you deem worthy to suffer for the sake of the name. I didn't say you have to like it. I didn't say that life should always be fair. It isn't. But you may, in fact, uh, you may, in fact, have to suffer. Okay. All right. Uh, share in the suffering of the gospel. Verse nine. Uh, by the power of God who saved us and called us to a holy calling. Now, again, that word holy, be careful with it. Um, holy doesn't just mean you're like pious, you know, um, that, that sense. But holy means different or set apart. So he called us to a different calling, a different, we're set apart. We're not supposed to look and sound and be like everybody else, okay? So everyone's wearing narrow ties. So let me go buy narrow ties. Everyone's got wide flag, oh, wide, wide uh, things on their jacket. So let me go buy that. Oh no, now we're back to uh, a double-breasted jacket. I got to go buy some double, you know, you get the idea. All that running around chasing after fashions and what the world thinks. No, we're to be holy. That is to say, we're to look and sound and be different from the world around us. Now that's not an invitation to being a sociopath. I don't give a rip what anybody thinks and we start just getting weird. No, don't be weird, okay? Do not be weird. That is not, but understand you're not going to just simply be able to go along and look and sound and act and be like everybody. If you're really, it's a holy calling. It's set apart. It's different. Okay. That's what the word holy means in its root meaning, okay? All right. Um, and um, um, he called us to this holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purposes and grace. Now, Hard truth of life number three, your life is not about you. Number two is you're not also, you're not that important. <laughs> Oops, didn't you say that? You know, you've heard my five hard truths. In case you haven't heard all five, here they are. Life is hard, number one. Number two, your life is not just about you. Number three, uh, you're, you're not that important. Number four, you're not in control. Number five, you're going to die. But number, number two and three are very important here because, you see, he called us not just because of our good works or something. Oh, look, I deserve this. Forget it. You'll never deserve God's mercy. Uh, it's, gift, it's, it's free, first of all. But you, you, you'll, you'll never really be able to earn it. That's not the point. It's, 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 a, it's a free gift of God. However, uh, we want to see here also, then, the fact that we have been called into this holy calling, this, this way of life, is not just because uh, of, of, of our, we, because for our own sake it is, but... It's also for his own purposes and the grace that he gave us in Christ Jesus. So you have a role in his kingdom that isn't necessarily just about you and what you want. A God might want you to be part of a bigger plan. And now that might mean that you'll be called to positions of authority, or it might just mean he wants you to be quietly living your life in the background. It might also mean, though, that he asked you to yield to somebody so that they can be blessed. Sometimes we send soldiers off to war to die so that others can live. We put police officers and firefighters into trouble and danger so that other people can be saved. Um, we have uh, people who live these kinds of lives where they, they set aside their life so that others can live. So it's not, you know, you see, you're always, you know, we think, well, it's all about me and what I want and my plans and little old me and, you know, we, we, get, we get so, um, What's the word I'm looking for? So precious. And we forget that sometimes God is asking us to make sacrifices, uh, not just um, for our own good, but also for the good of others. Okay. So as I say, these are hard truths, but if we accept them, there's something freeing about them that they were not so bent out of shape when they come. Right. Okay. Well, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm being asked to, to set aside something so that somebody else can thrive, or I'm, I'm being asked to, you know, uh, you know, get into, you know, to, to some trouble uh, or put myself in danger so that others can be safe. You know, it's part of life. Okay. I heard somebody on mute. Someone want to say something? Okay. A few more lines, and I'll ask for more feedback from you. Um, it goes on to say here. Um, um, yeah, verse 10, in which is now this, uh, he gave us, you know, and is now manifest through the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. But Father, but Father, people still die, you see? Yeah, yeah, but that's, that's, not, that's not the death that he abolished. Um, the death that he abolished is, is this, this um, um, well, you may have heard this expression before in the book of Revelation, the second death which is that is to say that we, once we die, 
we are destined to just darkness and eternal either nothingness or eternal suffering. He abolished that. He reopened the door to heaven and made a way for us to go live and to have not just life, but eternal life. Now, what's eternal life? It's not just the length of life. It's the fullness of life, right? The fullness of life. So that we become more fully alive. See, that's, that's the idea of eternal life. It isn't just that it goes on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever, but rather that um, we become more fully alive. Now, hopefully some of you have experienced this. That is, you've gotten older, your body may be heading south. I can just talk for myself. Um, someone said, don't talk about me that way, Father. I ain't got a problem. Uh, but, um, but, but you're more spiritually alive. So for me, yes, my body's aging. Um, five years ago, I didn't have a gray hair in my beard. No, look at me, I'm, you know. Um, but I mean, you know, that's just a minor thing. But um, the body's heading south. But the, um, my soul is younger in a way, more alive, more joyful. I'm, I'm more energetic, uh, spiritually alive, see. Um, and that's, that's an experience that's kind of a foretaste of eternal life so that I'm becoming more alive as I make my journey. It doesn't just wait till you die and go to heaven. It's something that you can tap into and, and savor even now if you make this journey with Christ. Okay, and I am a witness. All right. Finally, let's just kind of finish this section out here. It goes on to say, um, um, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher, which is why I suffer as I do, but I'm not ashamed. For I know in whom I have believed, and I'm convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. So again, I may be suffering, I may die, I may go away, but this gospel, this truth that he's entrusted to me, to hand on to you, that's going to perdure. And you've heard me on this before, this litany, but look, let's be, let's be clear. Everybody, everyone's always announcing, oh, the church is dying, the church is... Look, our numbers don't look so good in the Western world right now, but I want you to know something. Empires have come and gone, and nations have risen and fallen. All this, all this talk about how the church is going to die and the gospel is going to go away, the gospel has been discredited. When all this foolishness of now is done, whatever you know, you, however you want to define the foolishness, we'll still be the church will still be here preaching the gospel. Okay, the church has something called indefectibility as a, as a gift. Jesus promised that the gates of hell would never prevail against the church. Now that implies that they're going to try. They're going to try, but that, um, that they won't be successful, okay? Doesn't mean we won't suffer. Doesn't mean our numbers will never be diminished. Doesn't mean there won't even be great sin and discouragement in the church, but it does mean that this gospel message will perdure. And look at this. Here we are 2,000 years later, and it's still here, okay? This scripture, this scripture, if you trust it for no other reason, just trust it because it's lasted all this time. It stood the test of time. You see? All right. Okay, well, how about comments, questions, rebuttals? <laughs> You're such a talkative group tonight. I was wondering if you could comment on the, um, the lines where he said, uh, sorry, the, the grace which he gave us in Christ Jesus ages ago. D mm. does, that, does that speak to maybe... Jesus being outside of time and that, because then in the next sentence, he says, uh, uh, who now, ma who has now manifested. Um, yeah, right. I don't know if that speaks to like the divinity of Christ and how we, we receive graces and, you know, before he was even, you know, born and things like that. Um, yeah. So I think you're, you're, you're on to basically the answer there already, Ben. I think that we've got um, a God who lives outside of time or who sees all time as at once. He's always known that you and I and all of us would exist. Before I ever formed you in the womb, I knew you, says the Lord, right? And I appointed you, he says, to be a prophet. He says that to Jeremiah. And in Psalm 139, it says, every one of our days was written in God's book before one of them ever came to be. God has always known you would exist, that you'd be a member of his body, you'd be a member of the church, that you would live in these times, at this this moment. He knew everything that would ever happen to you, everything that's... So this is what we call... Um, um, you know, the, you know the, that God lives in, in aeon or eternity. There's also, um, I don't want to get too much into it tonight, but the concept of predestination. Now, the Bible does teach predestination, but not double predestination. In other words, God does not predestine anyone for hell, okay? But he's always known those who would say yes to him. 
And we're not predestined in the sense that we're forced to follow a script, but God has just always known all the things we would say and do and all the answers we would give him. It's in other words, he's, he's not waiting for you to pray to him tomorrow. That's already present to him. See? Um, maybe I, I, for some of you who may not have seen this before, let me draw a picture, if I can, um, of eternity. Hang on a second. Just take me a second here. And what we mean by it. Let's say, okay, one, two, six, seven. Okay, now, if you see this, um, I don't know, can you see it? Uh, it doesn't look very clear. It's like a clock. Okay, that, that's just all washed out, isn't it? There, is that better? Now, you'll notice that, that one of these times, like this, it could be, say, 3 o'clock, another time is 9 o'clock, noon at the top, all right? So out there on the edge, there's a, um, there is a very, uh, you know, there, there are, there's a movement of time. But I'm going to put a little dot here in the center. Now, do you see that at that dot in the center, that all those times are equally present, 12, uh, what's that, uh, 10, you know, 3, 6, whatever, 9, uh, that, that all those numbers are equally present to the dot in the center, right? That is where God lives. God lives there. He's, the whole sweep of time is present to him in one moment. It's, it's all there. He's not waiting for you to do something. All right? So with all that in mind, um, we have, uh, we have a very, um, great, great mystery here, but in saying that there's predestination doesn't mean that you are forced into something. God has just always known. So I've given you this example before, but let's say you were on a hillside and you saw two trains on the same track coming toward each other. Uh, and you can say, man, this isn't going to ha- this is going to be good. This is not going to be good. They're going to, they're about to collide. And, um, and, uh, the fact though, that you know, that doesn't cause or force the engineers to run into each other. It just, it just means that you see it before it happens. All right. They're still free moral agents doing whatever they're doing. You're not forcing them because you can see what's about to happen to do it. You can just see it before it happens. Okay. So I hope that helps a little bit, Ben. It's a lot of deep mysteries of time and also of um, providence and God's will and how things work out. So the whole course of the course are taught on that. So Liz, Uh, mute. Oh, I just wanted to know, Ben, what passage of scripture was, what's the verse on? Oh, the, the verse I was looking at was verse um, 10. Yeah, verse uh, 9 and 10. 9 and 10, yeah. Yes, <laughs> 9, and 10, 9 and 10. Thank you. Good, yeah. So, so let me ask you a question, Father uh, Monsignor. Yeah. When you say that, I'll speak for myself in my life yeah. as God has stepped into my life. Okay. If he already knew where I'm going to be, what I'm going to be, why does he step into your life at certain times, do things at certain times because he's already determined that's what he wanted to do. Cause he wanted you to do this. How does that work in that? Yeah. spatial of time because well, he doesn't step in things yeah. change totally but yet he chose to step in in that time i truly believe in my life he stepped in at a certain time to help me so yes and he's always known that he would do that is my point yeah. it's not like he was watching your life unfold like a movie and says i better step in here uh i better step in here and help ken out uh you know uh it, but he's always known, you know, so, uh, let me give you, maybe sometimes gospel music gets at things in a pretty neat way. Um, God answers prayers sooner than right now and faster than immediately. <laughs> Isn't that a beautiful turn of a phrase? God answers prayers sooner than right now and faster than immediately. Why is that? Because he's always known you would ask. In fact, he's already provided. He's already provided everything you need for tomorrow. It's already laid up. All that. So the word, the very word providence means to sort of see ahead. Okay. Sorry again. What's that again? I missed it. Somebody said something. Okay. But again, providence, the very word providence means to kind of, in a way, it means to see ahead. Videre pro videre. Videre means to see. We get the word vision from videre. And uh, pro, in this case, kind of meaning for or before uh, something. So 
Um, God sees ahead of time and has already provided, but he's always seen. Your, your tomorrow is just as present as your 10 years ago to him. Okay? It's all there, present to God, as if in one moment. So he steps in, but he's always known he would step in. Does that make sense? So we don't want to ever take God and put him out in serial time like we live in, where God has to say, I think I better intervene here in a way I had not expected to do. Um, that's just not where God lives. Okay? It's very deeply mysterious, I understand, but I think it's, a, it's an amazing thing. In the book of Ecclesiastes, it says, God has put the timeless in our hearts without us ever knowing from end to end all the things that God has done. But we somehow know this is true. He's put the timeless, the eternal in our hearts. He put it there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, we're, almost, we're, we're a little more than halfway through the chapter. Um, any other questions before we move on? Okay, would someone else, uh, do you want to read, or Liz, you want to keep going, or what are we going to do here? I want to pick up with verse, um, verse, I think it's 13, right? 13. Yeah. So who's going to read? I'll read. Okay, go ahead. Uh, this is the um, NAB. All right. Take as your norm the sound words that you heard from me. In the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus, guard this rich trust with the help of the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. You know that everyone in Asia deserted, including Polygus and Homogenes. May the Lord grant mercy to the family of Onaphorus, because he often gave me new heart and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he came to Rome, he promptly searched for me and found me. May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you know very well the services he rendered in Oedipus. Okay, now, um, I feel like, okay, maybe my mind skipped here, that, but you started with 13. Okay, good. Now, it says here, follow the pattern of the sound words you've heard from me. Uh, the Greek word here, sound, can also be translated as healthy, healthy. Later on in the letter to Titus, he says, loquare que deci sanum doctrinum, only speak that which befits sound doctrine. Doctrine. Sanam is the Latin word, um, where we get the word, not just, um, sanam means, you know, uh, sound or, or correct, but it also means healthy, where we get the word like sanitary or uh, um, sane. You see, these, these words come. So the words, the, the, the words that, are, that are translated here, the sound words, um, how does it put it? Uh, verse 13, my translation says, follow the pattern of the sound words. Uh, it means healthy, strong, doctrinally true, correct. It means all those things, okay? So um, notice again, um, follow the pattern of the sound words you've heard from me. Now, um, in many places, it almost sounds a little arrogant where Paul says, imitate me, or he says, follow the pattern I've given you. He says it's in a number of places. And, you know, our modern minds kind of cringe a little. And we say, well, that kind of sounds a little arrogant, you know, imitate me and so on. But listen, if you're a parent or a teacher or a pastor, you want to set a good example. And maybe you're not always a judge in your own case as to whether you've done it. But the goal isn't to just, you know, uh, you know, point to somebody else, go, go ask or look at them. You want to be that example, that pattern. Someone can look at you and say, now that's what it means to live the Christian life. You see, that's the goal. You're supposed to not just be an information provider or a hypocrite, or you're not supposed to do any, you're supposed to be someone who lives, who models the, the, the Christian life for other people. Now, this is not done in some univocal way. We, we all model different aspects of the Christian life. Some of us are joyful and exuberant. Others of us are more serious and uh, introspective, but, and, and deeply prayerful, you know, and, and I could go on, but you get the idea. It's not that, that we don't have maybe different ways and patterns that we manifest, but the point is, can someone look to you and to me, and saying, now look, that's the way, that's what Jesus is getting at. That's the way to live, see? Saint Mother Teresa had a saying that says, there is no more certain proof 
of the presence of God in a person's life than joy. Joy. If you know the Lord, people are going to see a joy in you. It doesn't mean a zippy do kind of, you know, peppy, you know, but they, a deep, stable, serene, confident joy. Not that you never have a bad day, but the general disposition that people know you to be is that you're serene, you're stable, you're confident, your life is in order, and um, that's the way to live. St. Peter says it this way, always be ready to render an account for the hope that is in you. That implies that people see a hope that's in you. So going around as kind of bored believers, distracted or discouraged disciples, all worked up about, you know, all this and that, and just, you know, angry or bitter or, or uh, having a chip on your shoulder, or, you know, you get the idea. I could come up with lots of, that. the danger for us is that um, we, we, uh, we no longer pattern or show the pattern of the model of the Christian life, right? Okay, so now Jesus knew how to be serious and he knew how to use anger when he needed to. But he, people loved him and they, they were attracted by him. You see, it, it wasn't just his message. It was him. They, they were astonished by him. No one ever spoke like this man, said the apostle or the, uh, the, the, the guards one day. Crowds came to him and it says they heard him gladly. Uh, but they, they knew he loved them. And, and there was something about him. Oh, I love the way in Mark's gospel so often he has a, some some reference to Christ's eyes. He always says, and looking at them, he said. There must have been something about his eyes. You know? I mean, I could go on, but when I say, if Jesus isn't just a message provider or a, a teacher who's giving a, a text or a, a philosophy. He is Savior. He's Lord. He's brother. He's friend. He's king. You see, the, the goal is relationship, not merely doctrine. Now, doctrine is important. Don't get that wrong. Don't go and invent your own religion. But the key point here is that you're, you're, you're relating to Jesus Christ and seeing him, you changed and you're, you're, and then you, you, you live your life by a different pattern. You have different priorities and your life begins to change. And you've heard me on this before, right? I mean, people underestimate what, what's supposed to be, what the Christian life is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be about a life-changing, transformative relationship with the Lord. And we all expect to meet people in this world that open doors for us, that having once met them, our life was never the same. We met teachers. We met people who hired us, people who were mentors. Look what that did for us. If human beings can do that, much more the Lord. So I think, Shirley, you're about to say something? Yeah, I, I was thinking um, about the, um, the, the movie The Chosen. Yeah. We talking about the joy of the Lord, how... Mm -hmm. When he, I mean, with the children, with the apostles, I mean, everything was a smile and you just could not, not want to be with him. Yeah. You know, it, so yeah, that, it's a very that, beautiful yeah. picture of that. It is. Mm -hmm. There was something very appealing about the Lord. Now, yes. I, Ben and I were thinking, we're talking about this uh, at breakfast one morning, but we're also hoping, though, that in the series as it unfolds a little bit, there will be uh, some of these scenes where Christ did have to confront people. You know, there, it wasn't all just, you know, chipper, uh, let's, you know, uh, you know, let's, let's be, you know, uh, positive. It was, but it was, there were also times where he could look and say, now thus, he says, you, you, you know, you, you got to change, you know, he says, woe to you, you know, things like that. So we're wondering how, as the chosen unfolds, how some of those scenes will be covered and whether they'll be covered well or not, you know, because they've done a very good job of the yeah. part you're describing. And that's an important thing. We don't want to forget Jesus was, he had an appeal. There was something about Jesus that just got to people, uh, yeah. and, and in both ways, not just in, oh, look at me. So then, then there were other people that envied him and were angry and bitter because he was better. Frankly, he was just better than they were, you know? Anyway, yeah, but that's a good point, Shirley. Yeah. Okay, well, um, let's just read on a little bit. Um, follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and the love that are in you in Christ Jesus. So again, this idea of that faith and love that are in you in Christ Jesus. Now, um, again, what, 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 is, what is faith? It, it, is, it is the gift to adhere in my mind to truths revealed by God simply because God reveals them, not because I have all the evidence. That's the gift of faith. That I'm, I'm, I'm given this gift so that I can accept things that I can't immediately prove or see for myself, 
but I trust God to reveal them to me and, um, and, and, I, and having revealed them, now I know them with certainty. I haven't seen heaven yet, but I know there is one because God told me so. And faith is that gift that let, lets me lay hold of that into my mind and then move from just the intellectual laying hold of it to the trusting, the building of my life that the Lord has given me a way to live uh, so that I can get there. And I'm really, uh, and I can only say this, and I know that not everybody, some people struggle to believe. And there's a mystery to that. I, except for a very brief period in my life, I've always been grateful to God. For me, belief is easy. I'm, I'm not easy, but I mean, it's, it's not been like, there's been a huge roadblocks to keep me from, from believing God. I, I just, I'm filled with wonder and awe in his creation. I'm just filled with a sense of his presence in my life. And I just see him at work all the time. I mean, that's a gift, and I thank God for it. And I realize that not everybody, you know, is that is, is has that gift to, to the fullness. And I pray for that. I pray because some people struggle. They just struggle to believe. They have doubts. They. I don't know if you ever remember that movie. It was actually a play based on a play some years ago called Doubt. Doubt. Um, it's a very interesting study in in doubt. Um, it's not a very pleasant theme. Uh, it's set in a Catholic church, a Catholic parish, where there's a very severe mother superior who's convinced that one of the, uh, one of the priests is abusing some of the children in the school. And um, she starts making accusations against him, and he denies the... Anyway, obviously a very... <laughs> with all we've been through, quite a, quite a scene. But, uh, but we come to discover that she herself has doubts, not just about this priest, but about God and she's struggling and that's part of her severity. Uh, anyway, it's a very powerful study in doubt. And again, I don't, don't accuse people. Oh, you're just doubting. Uh, people really sometimes struggle. They do struggle to believe because they've had evil in their life or they've, they've had some setbacks, things they don't understand. Sometimes they haven't just had an upbringing that helped them to believe. I don't know. There's lots of different reasons. So when we encounter people who struggle to believe or are atheist, even, we have to say, well, let's try to find out what we can do to at least point, point to the evidence, you know, of God and, and, um, but not, you know, be too sharp. Now there are going to be some militant atheists who just want to come after and make a ridicule. That's a different question. Okay. All right. Um, but faith is this capacity to simply know and believe in my heart what God has said and base my life on it in just a trust, an abandonment to God. And of course, uh, love, all right? Now, um, I'm gonna move on here just because it's, you know, it's, getting, it's getting on, so we need to bring it up. Are you, uh, you are aware, uh, verse uh, 15, you are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Pelagos and Hermogenes. Now, here we go again with the Jewishness, right? Everybody in Asia turned against me. Really, Paul? Everybody? That's like a lot of people. In, in, by the way, Asia, when he says Asia, he means what? Asia Minor, uh, like we modern day Turkey. Okay. He spent a long time there in, um, in, in Turkey. Um, you know, what we call today Turkey. Places like Lystra, Derby, Iconium, Ephesus, you know, a lot of those places, you know, that we went uh, on our trip. But the point is that, um, uh, Everybody turned against me. Everybody, oh, it's just terrible. Oy vey. It's just, you know, as a kind of a Jewish, Jewishness. Um, on the other hand, uh, Paul did at times feel real betrayal and discouragement in his ministry. People turned against him. Some people would just leave the ministry. I mean, one of the saddest lines is, Damus, an amateur of this world, has left me. You know, and uh, so we see these things. But there were people who did Paul a lot of harm. They tried to ruin his reputation. Judaizers and other people who were trying to undermine his message. Uh, the gospel was attacked from the very beginning, y'all. This isn't unique to our times. And uh, so he, um, he speaks here about, uh, about this. Um, May the Lord grant mercy, though, to the, house, to the household of Anisphorus, uh, for he's often re refreshed me um, and was not ashamed of my chains. So um, we see the um, um, not ashamed of my chains. You know, when someone gets in trouble, a lot of times it's kind of hard to find many, many friends who want to talk to you. <laughs> um, you know, you can, you can really know who your friends are when there's trouble. And, um, and they call you, how you doing, man? <laughs> uh, I kind of screwed up. Yeah, you did, but it'll be all right. 
know, I mean, you know, again, there's a lot of uh, people who were your friends before you got into trouble or whatever, got into some, now Paul got into trouble, not for any moral reason, but for preaching the gospel, but you know, not everybody's going to want to come and visit him in jail. Let's put it that way. You see the vision. So, um, um, so it goes on to say here, um, they're not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly and found me. That's a little bit like that movie. How many of you have seen the movie, The Apostle Paul? Um, it's, it's really worth seeing if you have it, okay? Um, and it shows, it shows Luke visiting Paul in prison there in Rome. And a lot of, a lot of really magnificent things take place in, in, the, uh, in that movie. Uh, it's a beautiful study. And some of it's speculative of the, but of the personality of Paul. Um, so may the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. In other words, may the Lord bless him because he's been so kind to me. Uh, you may well know that all, this, all the service that he rendered me at Ephesus. So it ends there. Now, we're going to, um, uh, so what we're seeing here, though, again, is that uh, Paul, like anybody, uh, can feel discouraged at times, feel abandoned. But again, he says, I'm still, ultimately, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of what I've done. Um, I am living this life in Christ Jesus. I'm a witness. I've set a pattern. He's in my life. And so we can sometimes feel that, that feeling of betrayal or sadness or discouragement. You know, my father had a very poignant expression that he would sometimes say, he should shake his head and say, Charlie, people disappoint. People disappoint. And uh, so again, you know, we, uh, what is it? One of the scriptures says, cursed is the man who trusts in human beings. Um, and um, yeah, cursed is the man who trusts in human beings. Um, again, that's not to say you have no trust, zero, but you know, you've just got to be careful to remember that Fellow human beings can't, it's not that they necessarily betray you, or but they just can't always help you. They just can't always give you what you need. It's just not possible. We're not God. So we have to learn to root our life in God because people will come and go. People who were friends either drift away or they move. We have other people who at times, um, um, you know, um, do betray us or at least, you know, kind of bad mouth us to others. We thought they were our friends. Um, so again, uh, all, all these are just ways of saying, um, um, if we're rooted in God, we can endure these storms, but they hurt. They can hurt. And I, you know, I've had to sometimes help people who've really been hurt by people to pick up the pieces. You know, they've been betrayed by a spouse or a son or a daughter. Sometimes they're very, very, very there can be very painful blows in life. And um, if we're not deeply rooted in God, those things can destroy us, make us cynical and bitter. Uh, so, but Paul is not that way. He is saying, you know, hey, hey, everybody abandon me. In other words, you know, I don't, I think what he's really saying there is, look, I did have one person from Asia visit me, uh, here in prison while they're in Rome. Uh, but very few have come to visit or tried to see me. I've had, I've had no letters, no correspondence from anybody there. So I think what he's getting at there is not, you know, literally everybody abandoned me, but I've, I'm kind of discouraged that nobody's taken the time to write to me, having heard of my imprisonment. Nobody's reached out to me. Um, People do visit Rome from Asia Minor, from Ephesus and places like that. Maybe they could stop by and try to see me. They don't. So there's a kind of a loneliness and a discouragement that he has, which is normal when you're in jail. You know? I don't know that from experience, by the way. Okay, uh, last comments or questions? Uh, Liz. Yes, um, I had um, a person that I ministered to um, every now and then, and um, he has, he struggles with a lot of his friends that he encounters. Um, mm -hmm. And so this week when I was doing the Beatitude, the readings of the Beatitudes, mm -hmm. I used that as a way of uh, reflection with him. And I um, just went over, um, you know, what we, we are blessed when we um, struggle uh, and, um, and, and like you just said, Christ said, you know, things are going to happen to us just because we are trying to be different. We're, we're, um, we're supposed to walk in a different way and, and be a different kind of person, yeah. but God never promised that we were going to be without cross, be without a cross and that people are never going to be satisfied or happy with mm -hmm. with our difference yeah um 
other right. thing you're the other thing you're sort of saying though, Luz, is that what is that beatitude? Blessed are those who mourn. So when you're mourning, you're still blessed. Yes. And I and I and I uh, what I had one of the things that somebody had stole something from him. And he said if they were really needed something, all I had they had to do was ask. Yeah. I would have happily given it to him. I know times are hard. I would have given it to him. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it would have been, a, you know, made yeah. me feel good to give it. I said, yeah. well, you don't have, you know, giving is, is a wonderful thing. But, you know, just know that God got your back and God got their back. Yeah. You, you will always have. So don't worry about that part. Good. Amen. You know, don't worry about that. You know, and then he told me two days later, the food that the person had stolen from them, a neighbor had left some food at his front door. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I said, see how God takes care of you? Yeah. Even when somebody's, you know, stealing from you. And as the neighbor in the building had left him some food at the front door to make up, I guess, for the food that was taken from him. Yeah. So, right. you know, yeah, so, God's got your back. He'll take care of you. Mm-hmm. Other Mark, comments, questions? Yes, go ahead. Um, when you had gone over the, the last portion of um, today's reading about the goal, I reflected back on our covering about the older woman and how there was the expectation for her to um, present the Christian way of life, so to speak. And I don't know if there is a connection that way or did I mistake that? You know, that she was supposed to follow spiritual steps and so oh, you're supposed to good. have that kind of pattern when you are um, making the changes in your life. Yeah, you're talking about the uh, the chapter in, in First Timothy where you're talking about widows. Right, widows. Yes. Yeah. yes. Um, I think that, yeah, certainly they, they, there's to be a pattern to their life. Like, for example, our religious sisters here who are not widows, but, but they, they live according to a pattern or a rule of life. Uh, we, they follow a certain cycle of prayers and a certain structure to their day. And there are, they, they follow vows of chastity, poverty, and obedience. And, and so we have, uh, these, these are, again, as you say, patterns, uh, if you will, or a rule, a rule meaning not just a list of do's and don'ts, but a rule is like a way of life that they follow, you see. So uh, yeah, that's a that's that's a good observation. Yeah. There's a pattern to the Christian life. There are basic component parts to it that all of us should have. And again, there might be some specific special things that certain people in certain states of life follow. The married have certain things like absolute fidelity and so on. Um, a clergy again, uh, we 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 have a certain pattern of prayers and a life we're expected to live, and, and so on. So yeah, yeah. Okay. By the way, you know, just to quickly remind you that, for example, the Lord gives us a pattern for prayer in the Our Father. It's not just words to say, right? It's, it's got five basic things uh, that, that our spiritual life, a pattern for our prayer and our spiritual life, that it has five basic components. And I'll just list them. I can't develop it tonight. But um, it, it is, um, you know, again, to, uh, you know, to relate our Father. You're praying to the deity. You're not praying to the deity. You're praying to your Father who loves you. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So relate, rejoice, praise him, love him, have praise in your life, you see? Uh, so uh, relate, uh, rejoice, um, receive. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Here I am, Heavenly Father, teach me, I'm listening. Teach me your way, teach me your word, see? Uh, request, uh, thy king, uh, give us this day our daily bread. Let bread, you know, all our needs. So... We, re- we relate, our Father, we, we rejoice, we praise Him, we, uh, we, we, we uh, receive from Him, we, he, he teaches us, we request our daily bread, and then we repent, forgive us our trespasses, and so on. So there's a pattern, you see, to prayer. Does your prayer life look like that? Does it have those five elements up and running, um, would be the question. So there are these ideas of rules or patterns are, are important for us, because God knows how we're made, and he knows that we need basic things up and running in our life, okay? So uh, we also see another pattern in Acts 2.42. They devoted themselves to the uh, t- uh, the apostles' teaching, 
to the fellowship, to the breaking of the bread, and to the prayer. So basically the four basic elements of the Christian life. Sacraments, the breaking of the bread, which is the Eucharist, and then by extension all the sacraments. The apostles' teaching, so scripture, um, fellowship, you know, holy fellowship, where you're in, you're in good Christian relationships with each other in the church. And then finally, um, prayer, both liturgical and private, the four pillars of the Christian life. So these things are spelled out for us in many places, these patterns. Okay? I could say more, but look at me. It's getting to be close to nine. And Father. Monsignor. Yes. Um, before before we leave this evening, um, um, I just wanted to ask you if you would. Um, yesterday, we, uh, Connie Savoy, uh, one of our uh, members here, also mm -hmm. of the church, she had a big, beautiful birthday yesterday. Oh. And I'm going to say it a big 8 0. Uh oh. And, Octogenarian, and Connie? <laughs> Yeah, and so um, um, Connie's been my prayer partner for about 12, 15 years, since right after her husband passed. And she's a very, very, um, she's a Eucharist. Connie is this holy comforter extraordinaire. <laughs> and I yeah, know we're... most of us who know her, and she's a woman of God. She's She loves her family and her family you know, so she's constantly praying for them. But I just wanted um, us to acknowledge that. And if you would yeah. give her a special blessing. Yeah, now she's here on, on line with us, here under Connie, right? This is the same. Uh-huh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, good. See if we can unmute you, Connie. I don't know. You've got that thing locked down on me there. There she is. No, still muted. Okay. Connie, can I, you unmute? Then, Connie's not that. Oh, there, Connie, can there she is. Connie? Yeah, that's so. I, I guess we can't hear, but all right. Well, we'll certainly do that, and also we'll keep in mind uh, while we're doing a birthday blessing for her that Father Tolentino celebrates his 70th I, birthday today. I know, yeah. Father, a former pastor here, Father Tolentino, hits 70. I said, "Oh, I, you septuagenarian, you." <laughs> <laughs> all right, Connie, we're going to pray for you, okay? And we'll keep Father T in mind too. So, Lord, we thank you. Uh, as we were thinking earlier, Lord, that. Uh, before Connie was ever formed in her mother's womb, uh, you knew her, Lord, and you prepared for her. And you didn't just get her parents to meet, you got her great, 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 great grandparents, all in just the right combination so she would come to be just as she is. And we thank you for the gift that she is. You knit her together in her mother's womb. She's wonderfully, fearfully made. And every one of her days, including this 80th birthday, was written in your book before one of them ever came to be. You cared for her all these years, Lord. Keep caring for her. We know you will, but you tell us to ask. And so we are. And may Almighty God, Send rich blessings upon you, Connie, and um, your life is sacred because it comes from God and it's the fruit of God's love. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And that prayer for Father T, too. <laughs> <laughs> and Monsignor, um, um, I heard on the news today that the bishop was going to let D.C. have um, masses, 10 people... <laughs> <laughs> Ten people in church at a time, so <laughs> I don't know how that's supposed over. to work. Did near, you hear anything? Really <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, look, we said this earlier. I think before you came on, Liz. So okay. we're going to do a, a starting not this weekend. We just can't. And it's it just wouldn't work uh, this coming right. weekend. It was too fast. Yeah. But I will say that uh, starting Monday we're going to begin daily mass uh, uh, again and. Um, but we'll have to be careful and limit it. So we're going to put out, I'm going to put out a video on Friday that will describe some of these things. Okay. okay. So more, more, more information to come, but uh, Ben's uh, our Uber group and Führer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's helping out the task force to make sure that we're ready uh, for, uh, for things. But so technically Monday uh, things will begin, um, but uh, that'll be daily masses. But the first Sunday will be not this coming Sunday, but the following and we'll describe what we're going to do. We're going to have to do maybe several masses, and then we'll have little communion services so that if people come, obviously the church is going to fill up quickly with just a limit of 10. So we'll have sort of a, off to the side some communion services going on as well uh, so that um, uh, people who do come can receive communion, even if they can't get in for that particular mass. So we'll, we'll give you all this information later. And I don't want to bore some of the... Uh, 
hope folks who are, you know, this doesn't apply to anyway. So we'll, we'll more to be said, okay? Okay, thank you, Monsignor. Sure. sure. All right, well, may Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unmute you all so you can say uh, bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. 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 Okay. Bye. Thank you, Monsignor. Thank you, Monsignor. Thank you, Monsignor. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.